Hello and welcome to the next video for Mr Everett's top channel. This video is dedicated to the area of knowledge which is the natural sciences. Now before I go through the details, I uh, just wanted to make a couple of points about what a study of the natural sciences can offer in terms of our understanding of knowledge more generally. First of all, the scientific methodology itself gives us a very clear understanding of a logical process that leads to knowledge production. And that can give us some insights in terms of how knowledge is produced in the other areas of knowledge. Secondly, in terms of understanding or investigating that methodology, there are also very clear links to certain key top concepts. Most important of these are the role of evidence, justification and explanation and together these lead us to a clearer understanding of truth and the relationship of say scientific truth in terms of certainty. Thirdly, from this analysis the natural sciences also gives us a great lens uh, through which we can understand how and why knowledge changes uh, and in doing this we can get a firmer grasp of paradigms and what the role of paradigms are in terms of what knowledge is and how it is produced. Lastly, we can also uh, get some understanding of first principle ideas, specifically the problem of induction and also the role of consensus or group verification and what those mean for knowledge in both the natural sciences and in other areas of knowledge. So, without further ado, let me go to the PowerPoint and explain some of these points in more detail. First thing to be clear about is what are the natural sciences themselves? Well, really they comprise the investigation of the physical world around us. So, the natural sciences are both a body of knowledge, but they also are a process. Uh, and that second point is really important, we'll get to that in a little uh, moment. The natural sciences are generally divided, in schools at least, into physics, chemistry and biology. And it's also important to recognise that these divisions are somewhat arbitrary. Uh, and you could argue that there's a huge amount of crossover between these different uh, subject areas. Uh, and that itself tells us something, I think, about knowledge more generally. Uh, and that's one of kind of the, the fundamental ideas, I think, behind philosophy and to an extent the theory of knowledge, that we are interested in knowledge as a whole. Uh, and one of the important things to do when looking at the different areas of knowledge is trying to gain insight from maybe an investigation of one area of knowledge and what that might tell us about another area of knowledge. The first thing to look at really is the scientific method. This is the process that leads to scientific knowledge claims and it's one of the most important aspects of any investigation into the natural sciences. The observation stage is really where it all starts. So I'll try and explain this using the classic example of Newton. So Newton's there looking around and he sees the apple fall from the tree. And you could argue that that observation is repeated when any physical object falls to the ground. That leads to the second stage, the hypothesis. He hypothesizes that there must be a reason why objects fall to the ground and that hypothesis is really the idea of gravity. Now at this point you don't really have scientific knowledge because what that hypothesis needs, and this is incredibly important and a hallmark of the natural science, is experimental evidence. There's the link between stage three, the experiment, and the top concept of evidence. So the evidence is supporting the hypothesis. Following from that, you're then able to develop a law. Now this law is really important in terms of this being a result of inductive logic. If you go back to the experiment, the experiment represents particular instances. So if you run the experiment 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000, 10 million times, theoretically at least, 
These are all particular instances. From these particulars, you then develop a law which applies to the general. Going back to Newton, in gravity, the general would be that all physical objects in the universe apply a force of attraction on other objects. The final stage of the scientific method is the theory. The theory links to the top core concepts because the theory embodies the explanation element. And this is also a requirement for knowledge. The hypothesis is the guess as to what is going on in the world. The theory explains it and it is itself supported by the evidence gained from the experimental stage. Now it's important to mention here that there are some developments that are in integral to the validity of the scientific process. The first one to highlight is during the experimental stage. You develop your hypothesis, you think of the experiments the, the, the hope will be, optimistically, that the experiments will support the hypothesis. However, this is not always the case. And experiments can in fact show the hypothesis false. At this point, the scientific method would really revert back to the hypothesis whereby you need to rewrite that hypothesis develop new experiments or run the same experiment in a different way that will lead to ultimately uh, a different scientific law and a different theory. This is very important because good science, valid science, follows the experimental data. I've included here three real life situations or examples that you could use to illustrate how falsification works in the natural sciences from the world of the ancient Greeks, the planet Venus, which they originally thought was two planets, uh, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, discovery of oxygen and the falsification of the theory of phlogiston, and then you've got Einstein's theory of relativity. An additional stage after the theory is peer review. Peer review essentially is the idea that at the end of the scientific method, the scientist or the scientific team needs to write up their scientific process, all of the stages that we've talked about, uh, publish those in a reviewed journal by which other scientists around the world, whoever uh, cares to show interest, are invited to check the quality of the scientific claim produced. The best way to understand peer review, I think, is in terms of group verification. And it shows us that, as well as experimental data, the sciences also have a strong element of consensus, which contributes to the quality of the scientific claim produced. If the scientific community do not agree with the scientific knowledge claim, then it is highly unlikely that that claim will be accepted as scientific knowledge. Now, peer review has its own internal problems that I'll just mention very quickly here. The first is that science is not divorced from the human world. Essentially, the way the scientific world is set up in terms of career, salaries, promotion, etc. Scientists gain more kudos. Uh, they will gain more opportunity to increase their financial rewards by discovering or creating new knowledge claims. As a result, Far more effort and investigation goes into producing new knowledge than it does checking pre-existing or existing knowledge claims. Therefore, it's arguable that a flaw in the system is the human element. This slide really deserves more time, but I just think it's very important to make the link here between peer review 
and the key concepts of power and responsibility that are in the top course. In terms of the natural sciences, you could argue that scientists have both a lot of power and a lot of responsibility in terms of the knowledge being produced. You could also say that as students of science in the IB curriculum, students don't really have much power in terms of that knowledge produced in a group with. However, you could say at a personal level, the students share in the responsibility and power of their own personal knowledge with the teacher. Uh, and you can go on and on with this as far as you want to go. So for example, you could argue that one of the problems of the peer review process is that the power of the scientific knowledge is not only on the shoulders of the scientists, but you could argue there is more power in terms of the corporations which those scientists work for. Just think of the uh, production of new medicines, very topically at the moment, the vaccine against the coronavirus or the COVID-19 virus. And then how is that power distributed in those corporations? Remember, those corporations are usually owned by shareholders. So they assert power in terms of scientific knowledge production. So that concludes part one of my introduction to the natural sciences. The focus there was really on the scientific method, looking in particular at falsification and also peer review. Part two is gonna be looking in more detail at the problems of the scientific method and how those problems can lead to Thomas Kuhn's idea of scientific revolutions. Essentially, that science knowledge changes over time. If you like that video, please subscribe and also don't forget to smash the like button.